Right, hello. This is a session about teaching styles. I was asked if I would do something about my teaching style and when I thought about it, I thought, well, the only way I want to explain how I teach is to do it how I normally work, which is always, we'd normally have a full horseshoe or a circle, we've opened it up for the cameras and I kind of use a mixture of different things, but one of them is always about going around everybody and letting everybody ask questions and a lot of peer learning. So thanks for being here. Um, I don't really know what's going to happen. I'm going to say some stuff, probably go off the point quite a bit, ask you some questions, you're going to ask me some questions and there's some more people who might bob in and out and um, maybe something will be revealed about my teaching style, which is now 23 years in its formation. Uh, it comes from all kinds of different sources. So you've all got a little list of things there that you can look at, look at which might jog your interest or make you ask a question or something. Probably best if you put them down and don't flap them about too much if, uh, if you've looked at them enough. Um, so I'm just going to start how I would normally start every class, which is to say hello. This is what's happening. That was that bit. So I've got Sam who's a media second year, Megan's a second year, Tom's a second year. Matt is currently being traumatised by third year dissertation land. Rosie is third year dissertation land, but a bit of a weirdo hippie because she's doing environment and media. And Phoebe finished two years ago and nearly escaped, but I've dragged her back in to see what she thinks about it with a little bit of hindsight. So I've just asked everybody to come up with a question and let's just see what happens. So let's go that way. Do you want to start with me, Doug? Not really. I just want to get yeah, you out of the way. Oh, okay. You use Facebook quite a lot I to do. get to your students. Do you think that's a productive way of doing things? Or like, if it's um, some people might say it's unprofessional. I disagree. I think it's mm. cool. No, it's a bit of a debate within academia, this one. Um, so, for me, Facebook, I, to be clear, I have a separate Facebook to my social one. Um, but I really like the way you can carve up classes instant messaging, post links, I think as a platform it's really good and actually if you keep it clean so that all you're using it for is very simple things, it, it just works. So like I haven't really got any of my stuff on mine, I guess, I guess there is an issue around professionalism the other way around that it seems to be the case that no students ever start a work only Facebook. I don't really know why, because you all could with your university email, but that's all I need. I just need a point of contact. But the way it seems to work is that I have a work Facebook, and some of my colleagues do, and students use their normal one. But um, I don't know. I don't, I don't really see that as a problem. But I think um, some of my colleagues have an issue around when you're available, that, that's an issue, availability, you know, because I'm a bit weird and I stay up late at night and I don't really mind answering questions when I feel like it within a 24-hour cycle, it kind of works for me, but for some people they really kind of feel the need to put a boundary around it and say, you know, work hours only or send me a work email and I'll answer within two working days, it's just not really how I work. So I just think it works and generally... If I post something, I can see how many people have seen it. If I put a message out, people seem to get it. If yeah. I put something out Student Central, it's anybody's guess what's going to happen. So, <laughs> for now, it's fine. Yeah, all right, cool. I agree as well. But what's your experience of it then? I just as think a, it's easier. Platform? It's easier because, you know, I don't really check my emails that much, I have to admit. Slash at all. At all. <laughs> and um, I'm always on Facebook, so, you know... See Doug, what's Doug up to? Let's ask him some questions. He's always there, so that's all. It's all good. Good. I nice. like it. Mm. Megan. Um, mine's kind of like as to like the mentoring, because you put a lot of hours in for your students. Why? Why do you choose to do that over? I mean, you said about the working hours. Mm. Well, if you do it for a dissertation, I gather that you get a lot of time with you to do, like discuss stuff. Why yeah. do you? Why do you do that so much? Why do you do it? Um. Well, I kind of have my own standards of... I, I want to feel that I've done whatever I could to support somebody in fulfilling their potential. Mm. If they then choose to take that up, great. If they don't, I'm not going to beat myself up about it. So it's kind of a result of 
I'm quite an anxious person and I'm quite a perfectionist, quite driven in some ways, but I can't make somebody do something, but I can do my best for them to do it for themselves. So I managed to carve out of my three day week enough time, it seems, to see everybody that I need to see. And um, and then when I go home for the weekend, I don't think about it. Like, that's how I want to do it. I don't, I don't mind working in big chunks, but then I'm off when I'm off. Yeah. So, and I, for me, it's all about contact time. You know, that's that's everything to me, really. And I think it's important for me as a teacher to check that somebody's got it. If they have, if I go past the point where they haven't got it, and then I carry it, like that's my worst thing as a learner is if a teacher says something and I don't really get it, and then they carry on, I start to mm. get that sinking feeling and a bit panicky. Mm. So I think that's my thing as a teacher is to to be as sure as I can that somebody's got it so that when they go away they can carry on doing something with it and then I can let go of it. Okay. Thank you. Tom? Um, yeah, within video production, especially the first year, um, the classes are always different, so you're sort of guessing who should you be in a group with um, and you can't become like very dependent on each other and if that person or a group of people don't pull through within the group, um, how do you think that could be resolved? Sometimes it's a total nightmare, but the video's great, and sometimes it's great and the video's all right. I mean, it's just the mystery of the world, isn't it, group work? I mean, my tip on it is all... I mean, it's very common that I have the conversation with people like yourself, if I can say that, where you kind of come back and go, right, there's two people in the group who are just dead wood, they're just not doing anything, it's doing my head in, we're having to do all the work, it's not fair, well, they're going to get the same mark as us, blah, 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 getting a bit bitchy. Just <laughs> had to say that at the time, didn't we? Brilliant. And oh, then cool. it's like, well, you're here because you're interested in learning, you presumably are interested in the creative industries in some way, shape or form, so if someone else isn't doing their job, that's just a bonus for you mm. to learn something else. That's how I see it. So you can either put your energy into being negative and bitchy and moaning about somebody not doing it, or just go, brilliant, that's something else I can learn. It's hard, though, mm. and it's group dynamics are really, really hard. I mean, that is the different thing from my teaching to anything else, really. I think the intensity of group work can really make or break friends for life. And um, not hard... There isn't any wood to touch. I've uh, not had an actual physical fight in my class yet, but, yeah, it's come close a few times. Mm. I don't know. I don't really know. What, like, my other answer to that one is, like, I do all that stuff about bell bins and character types. It's like, instead of getting pissed off at somebody to go, right, they are really annoying, but they're really good at that bit. Can I find a way of employing that, that thing that they're great at? Mm. That's kind of, for me, that's management and directing and producing effectiveness. So it's the art of seeing somebody as the pain in the arse as your greatest gift of management kind of production directing opportunities. I mean, that's kind of what I try and do with, with all my students is to look for potential and look to see what I can work with, which is, for me, whatever the weakest link is, put the effort in start doing something great great just carry on but nobody's I don't think anybody's great at everything mm. it is a bit of a nightmare though group work sorry I didn't invent it <laughs> <laughs> hello Matt hello um, I'd say you've got quite a relaxed um, teaching style literally sometimes when I've had uh, meetings with you been like so relaxed you've literally been laying down but across two seats but um, <laughs> how how would you say that you'd stop um, people who don't know you as well taking advantage of how relaxed you are? Well, it's a double-edged sword, that. I mean, it's... Mm. OK, one of the... Like, I, I'm really conscious about body language, so one of my... My plan B backup job before teaching was a care assistant. I was a care assistant for a long time, looking after old people. And what I noticed is... Um, what do you call it, a stand-in? Agents, like agency work, care work, looking after old people, is you'd turn up at a rest home full of beautiful old dears, and then people would start feeding them. 
and they'd be literally standing over them, over the table, shoveling food into their faces. And I just thought, that's horrible. So I have quite a lot of things that I do that I'm quite aware of body language. So if I'm talking to groups, I'll, either, I'll always come down to the same level, if at all possible. And quite often that will involve kneeling on the floor or something like that because I don't want to stand over somebody because I think that really, really changes the dynamic as a teacher if you stand over people. Sometimes you kind of have to do it a little bit because you want people to shut up. But other times it's like... I don't know, that's like a, per a personal style thing. And, I'm, you know, the truth of it is I'm not really laid back inside. You know, it's intense. And like my Thursdays, I see somebody every half an hour for like seven hours sometimes. So sometimes I'm just knackered. And other times <laughs> it's like, oh, it's... If we could just go down to the pub and have a pint, probably do that. Sometimes it's just that it is a bit more relaxed. Sometimes it really isn't very relaxed at all, you know. So I don't know, it's a bit of a mixed bag. And I think sometimes it's whatever works. Like with your supervisions... I'm working with a sort of anxious energy quite a lot. It's not coming from you. So sometimes it just helps somebody kind of let go. If you, Sometimes it's so formal in somebody's head, you need to make it informal so that they don't freak out as much. I don't know whether it works or not. You'll have to ask your partner that. Right? <laughs> I don't really know what you could do to take advantage of it, though. I mean, it's not really an issue for me. Bring in an air bed if you want. <laughs> nice. Rosie. Um, you do quite a lot of like emphasis on peer to peer learning. Mm. Um, what do you think like the main benefits of that at kind of university level rather than kind of in kids? Because I know why it's used with children, but at university level. Okay, well you you lot don't know each other. So con conventionally, first, second and third years don't even know each other. Sometimes people don't even know people in their own year. That's quite a strange culture. So Phoebe, yourself and Matt, I've, I've brought in pre all of you into classes below you to chat to the classes below you about what it's like to be a year or two ahead. I think that's really invaluable to see like where I'm at now in two years' time. I don't, that's not quite peer, is it? Because you're a little bit further ahead. Mm. But I, my feeling generally is that if everybody shares, that seems to be about eighty percent of what's going on. Like that needs to be said between everybody, and then I just facilitate it a bit and add a few bits and bobs. So it came out of personal development and other ways of working that I just saw this this method, circle time or an arc or a horseshoe or whatever you call it, just seems to cover so many bases. And I, I, it's also coming from that place of like, I don't really know what's going on. I mean, I'm just, I don't know. Like, I don't, I'm not like a lecturer, like I've got a research profile and I bring that to impart my wisdom for you to write down and take away. I'm not that kind of teacher, really. I'm a facilitator. So that that is always about whatever's going on in the room at that moment in time. And then I just not look to see if there's any gaps to fill in. I don't know, does that answer that question? I guess kind of. Because I guess with, with younger children, obviously peer-to-peer -peer learning, it's about kind of learning how to work with other people and group dynamics and learning about your place with other people and like are you kind of building similar skills using peer-to-peer -peer learning with people going through their degree or are you trying to build kind of a different set of skills that kind of well listening is, is the main one it's really hard for people to listen and actually it's easier for students to listen to each other than it is to a teacher so it's good practice hmm I might have to come back to part two of that. <laughs> I think there's something else there, but I don't know what it is. Okay. Thanks. So, Phoebe, two years since you left this building. Yes. As a proper grown-up. <laughs> Not sure about that. Um, my question was, obviously you're teaching the same, um, you're teaching in first year, second and third year. Do you ever get frustrated kind of 
repeating yourself and when do you think it starts to kind of actually click in? So I did video production in first year, second and third year as my dissertation. And it probably wasn't until the end of third year that it actually, you know, clicked in and start actively mm. acting on, you know, your advice, I suppose. Does that get frustrating watching that happen year after year? Not really, because it's how it's meant to be. It's beginners, in, beginners, intermediate and advanced level production. So mm. I love teaching beginners stuff. I really love that. Um, for me, that's the heart of teaching is mm. absolute beginners who think they can't do something, getting it that they can do something. That's yeah. really exciting when the light goes on. Second year is kind of like grounding that experience into more content. And the third year usually is like, oh, right, that whole pre-production stage that I ignored twice probably would have been good to pay attention to. (laughs) So then it sort of kicks in that the initial stage, which, you know, in the first year is five weeks of doing nothing and then going out and shooting everything and making sense of it. But realising in, I think sometimes you have to, it's an experiential learning from not yeah. doing it. I don't. I don't know any. I wish I could find another way of doing it, of making people get it, without not doing it to get it. Yeah. But that seems to be the way that it is. But no, all my courses that I've. I mean, I've written all my own courses, and they're the same every time. I mean, I've taught the same formula for twenty three years, but every group's different. Mm. And every group dynamic's different, and every video's different, or radio show. So I really like that, that I don't really... Like, my preparation for a day's teaching is about 10 minutes over a cup of tea the night before of, like, where are they up to? What do I need to say to them this week? And maybe I need to post a couple of things, and then mm. it's done. So a lot of my colleagues spend a long, long time preparing lectures and kind of having to go through that, and I, I don't really do that. It's a different type of teaching. Mm. So no, I haven't got sick of it yet after 23 years. <laughs> so should we go around again and see if you've got Back any more? to me. Hmm. Do you want to talk about some of your Duggergrams? The famous Duggergrams, like Lovely But Useless model, which I've heard a million times. Well, why, don't you, why don't you tell me what your understanding of the Lovely But Useless model is? <laughs> Basically, we're all lovely, but we're all useless in your class. I think that's the point you're trying to get to us. Mostly. Not, not Apart all. Apart from me, like, there's a pyramid... I can't remember. Yeah, it's an inverted pyramid, yeah. Inverted pyramid. And all the lovely but useless people at the top, so there's a lot of them. And then in the middle, it's lovely but slightly useful. Potentially useful, yeah. Potentially useful. And then right at the bottom is like where I am, the useful. <laughs> but not necessarily lovely. But not... I'm lovely. What are you trying to say? Well, what I'm but, trying to say is that... You know, you've you've been out on placements, all of you, and you've all had experience of the way that the media industry industry is run. The people who are very useful, who run things, are quite often not lovely. No, nah, they're not interested right. in being your mate. I mean, it's just a, it's just an interesting thing to notice that most people want to be liked. That I mean, that's the thing about teaching is, if you need to be liked as a teacher, it's it's disastrous. Like I can right. go down to the down the pub with you and have a pint in a different mode. But in the classroom, I'm not interested in being a mate. That's not my job. That's that's a professional thing. So the lovely but useless model is just do what you said you were going to do. That's it. Mm. Most yeah. people say they're going to do something and then they have no intention of doing that thing. Or they sort of have an intention of maybe possibly doing it. But for me, if I'm bringing somebody in on a professional project and there's money and clients involved... However much I adore all of you, there's very few people that I think I could guarantee they would just do what they said they were going to do without me having to worry about it. Because if I have to worry about it, I might as well just do it myself. Yeah. That's all it is. There's no great mystique, but it's amazing how few people will just always do what they said they were going to do. Most, yeah. pe- most people say what they think you want them to say or what they would like to do, neither of which have any reality in the material world. <laughs> oh, mm. that is a dogogram. Where would you put me on the pyramid? <laughs> put you on the well, spot. You, you're, no, you you are in the lovely and moving into potentially useful category yes. because <laughs> I've brought you in as an ambassador, which is a whole other spin-off of things that we do, where you know we ask you to stand up in front of a, a re- an auditorium full of 
scared potential students and their um, parents without any briefing. I mean, I mean, nobody tells you what to say. We just, if we put you in that position, if I put you in that position, it's because I trust you. So then it's like there's nothing to say. Just like, like now, I don't have to pre 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 prepare for this. I just have to be present. Yeah. And then it, it's okay. What? Wow. So being present is very difficult. Most people are so in their heads in the future or the past that they're, they're barely in the room. Yeah. Does that get too deep? I always get too deep, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> Let's <laughs> move on to Megan. We'll come back to another one. Um, I was going to say, all your, your teachings in documentary style, and in my experience, I've had a lot of rubbish ideas that have kind of needed to be thinned out a bit so that they can become a bit more precise. What is, why, why are so many ideas so rubbish? <laughs> Because, because they're not thought the through, thing. because they're not researched and they're not thought through. I mean, if you if you had a lot of money on it, like, and you, the amount of time you'd spend on generating ideas and working through of like, right, let's start off with 20 ideas that we're vaguely interested in and really whittle them down to like five and then everybody go away for three days and think about it for three days and really come back and have a proper meeting about it, whittle mm -hmm. it down to one, properly try it out for a week. Nobody's doing that. If you were doing that, you'd know the difference. But I so some of the ideas are just plainly quite flaky, that like they're a bit... No, but any flaky. idea can work. It's like, it, it, could, it could be about chairs. Like, if you <laughs> went away and thought about it, like chairs, you know, the, I, I always find with furniture is like, it either looks good and it's uncomfortable, or it's uncomfortable and looks good. Why can't you have furniture that looks good and is comfortable? I mean, I could do a whole documentary on that. <laughs> Anything. Curtains. What, you know, what's it with curtains? Why have we got curtains everywhere? Lights, you know. You know, anything. It can be anything. I wrote down 30 ideas at the bus stop in 10 minutes the other day as an experiment in ideas, thinking about your stuff, actually. And it was like... It can be anything. But actually, what most people do is a bit of a generic student-y idea for students who are a bit like them... Mm pushing the edge of their comfort zone, which we haven't got into yet, a little bit, but it's like, a, gr a great idea is something that makes you go, oh, bloody hell, I've not thought about that before, that's a really interesting angle or perspective or, God, I've never thought about that before. Mm. So it just takes a lot of work. I mean, people who are great at ideas are like creatives in the advertising industry get paid a lot of money because they can just, they can turn up with 30 ideas and somebody goes, nope come back yeah. tomorrow with another 30 endlessly I think the thing is that you get attached to an <laughs> idea and then it becomes you can get too precious not just you yeah. one can get too precious about an idea like in a way the the greatest point is that you're willing to throw it away at almost any point and just go no it's not working mm. just back to the drawing board so that's that's my thing is don't get to, so attached to the ideas yeah. Be willing to uh, work a lot harder at the pre-production stage. Okay. Thanks. Uh, my question links in quite nicely with that. Um, the pre-production stage is like quite overlooked. I found, especially within uh, my Slash first ignored. year. What's that? Slash ignored. Yeah, <laughs> in the first and second year. Um, how do you think this can be improved? Because my method of like getting a project out there is sort of add things into pre-production during production stages. So do you agree with that sort of method, would you say? Sorry, run that past me again. Right, I work um, by adding things in on the way. So as I've sort of ignored the pre-production stages, say, um, I sort of add things in. Some things that might work, some things that don't. Um, do you agree with that? I don't, I don't know. I don't think there's a... Because the idea is always changing, I find. Yeah, the idea always involves... I don't think there's like a rule of how you have to do it and that's it set in stone. I think there's lots of different ways of directing and running with mm. ideas. Sometimes it can be quite fluid. Sometimes you've really got to stick with, no, this is what we're doing and that's interesting but it's not relevant, so put it off to the side. I mean... Jenny, who's in the other room, was saying to me the other day about a lot of TV production now is shoot everything and work it out in the edit. 
I mean, that's the kind of legacy of non-linear editing and hard drive recording, is you can technically afford to do that, but conceptually I think it's quite weak because it generally leaves you without enough time to work it out properly. And, mm. you know, in the olden days of tapes and storyboarding and logging, I think there's something really focused about working out what you're doing and having the steering wheel in your hand and knowing where you're taking it. Mm. If you're blown about by the winds of whatever happens or somebody says something or the content seems more interesting over there, then I just think it's a little bit tricky. It might be an old school way of working, but I think it's a craft. Mm. I think we've lost a few crafts in non-linear editing and that's one of them is, yeah, it's good to have your hands on the steering wheel and know where you're going rather than let the con lead the content rather than let it lead you. But if it works and you get a great thing at the end, mm. great. But I guess the question is, is that sustainable? Like, on a five-minute video, that's sustainable. If it was an hour-long documentary and you were producing one every month, could you do it like that? Maybe not. So that's, for me, about establishing good working practice. And, yeah, sustainability is a big one. Because it's mental media production. I mean, you just go mental if you work all the time and editing and cameras. I mean, it just sends you mental. You need to have a break. So that's break. when you have to kind of <laughs> do something and know that that's enough. That's enough. I've got it in the bag. I don't need yeah. to keep doing more. But whatever works for you, Tom. I mean, I, I don't know. That's just my tip on it. Mm. Oh, I'm an old school old bloke, so what do I know? Back to basics. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your attitude towards giving students feedback on their work? Do you like to give them regular feedback or what works best for you? Well, feedback, I think feedback is everything. It's everything. And I, I have been very uh, fortunate in my life to have teachers who were relentless with their feedback. So, for me, I do it verbally, regularly, and written down at the end of the pre-production stage and at the end. A lot of people don't collect their feedback, actually, from the office. So I know quite a lot of people haven't got the feedback that I've spent a long time writing but again, it's kind of like your question. It's like, I, I need to know that I've given somebody all the information that they need to do whatever they need to do to improve. Then if they choose to do it or not do it, that's kind of up to them. But I, I, I mean, my, my feedback is probably a mixture of produce, producers who I worked with on the radio never said, that was great, Doug, ever. If something was great, they'd just put it out on the radio. If it wasn't great, they'd cut it up with a razor blade in front of my eyes and throw it on the floor. That was their feedback. Didn't have a discussion about it. It was like I said, three minutes, you've given me five, Razor came out, and I'd watched my beautiful band interview with the Ramones or whoever go onto the floor. And then I'd sit, I'd have to just, I'd have tears coming out of my eyes. Going, oh, that's two minutes of, like, I did that, it was lovely, I love it. And then I'd listen back to it and I'd think, yeah, that's better. Less is more. So, it's tricky, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> this is going to go no I will go into this story it's, oh, no, I, will. I will I'll try and make it short <laughs> I worked with a teacher who we, we were on a summer camp and I had to go out and do a thing overnight and I got lost on Dartmoor so with my teacher she was working with me in a very different way working to this but I got lost on Dartmoor for 12 hours with a rescue party out after me and I came back in the morning, I managed to find my way off via falling into a swamp and it was just, it was, could not have been more dramatic. If they could have sent helicopters up, they would have done, but they couldn't because it's zero visibility on Dartmoor. So my teacher that I was working with at the time, her feedback to me when I came back after 12 hours of nearly dying on Dartmoor, she popped her head into my tent and went, well, we did agree we needed to spend more time in nature, didn't we? And potted off. And I'm like... <laughs> That's beautiful. I didn't want somebody to fluff up my pillows or tell me, you know, thank God you're safe. I didn't want that. And then she came back five minutes later with an afterthought and went, I think you should go out again tonight and find out why you got lost. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of teacher I'm used to. They, don't, they never say to me the things that I want to hear. I don't want My mates can do that. I want something else from a teacher. That's weird feedback, but... Yeah, that's what you get the sort of tail end of sweetened up a little bit for you so you don't run away. <laughs> um, kind of like you often refer to yourself as like a facilitator or a mentor rather than a teacher. Like, do you think that your style of kind of 
facilitating your pupils' learning, it kind of allows them to develop kind of knowledge and understanding in a different way to somebody that's just kind of stood on a pedestal saying stuff. It's not like, I'm not saying I'm better, it's different. You know, production is an environment that I like to work in because it suits the way I am and I like to facilitate like that. But that isn't to say that there isn't a huge amount of value from lots of other teaching styles that just it's just different. I mean, it's like the difference between helping and assisting with technical kit or production. It's like if I help somebody to do it, that's like doing it for them. But, it's, but if I can assist somebody to do it for themselves, then off you go. I mean, I haven't really got very much to teach, really around production it's just a starter and then if you if you really want to become a filmmaker or more advanced stuff then that's kind of after this i'm just setting good practice in motion really yeah. <laughs> um do you we touched a little bit on comfort zones there um, mm. before um do you think that uh video production as a, a module allows students to move out of their comfort zones more than um, you know, like a, a normal lecture module? Yeah, well, look, the comfort zone thing, i better just briefly explain, is a personal development model that came from 20 odd years ago um, that is about you have a, a zone of habits and then you have things outside of that that you want. That by the nature of wanting something outside of that comfort zone, you have to get to the uncomfortable bit to get to them. Mm. So, the sort of cliched example is like New Year's Eve resolutions. Usually by the 2nd of January, people have forgotten that they've made it or it's raining or something happens that makes it not seem like such a good idea. And then people give up and quit on themselves and go back. So that's why I work with people who send me out onto Dartmoor for a second night running to find out why I got lost the first night because I don't want somebody to say, oh, that's terrible... Have a, you know, let me fluff up your pillow. I don't want that. Mm. You know, like, it's hard, but that's what makes you grow. And so, like, kind of what Tom was saying before about group work, I mean, if you end up in a beautifully harmonious, productive group, that can be the worst thing that could happen yeah. to you. I mean, that might be a lovely time and you might make an all right video, but it's, it's not comfortable working with other people. There's always group dynamics and power struggles and victim plays and all sorts flying around. It's not comfortable. Mm. It's not comfortable for me as a teacher being in the middle of it or whatever. Like, I'd rather just have a nice time and go to the pub. It'd be much better. <laughs> but that's not what you're here for. You know, that's something to do afterwards, isn't it? So, I mean, radio production, which I taught for a long time before was the fear of going live. You know, being in a yeah. studio and somebody goes, stand by and a red light goes on and you're suddenly live on air, that is terrifying. Mm. That was more scary than video production in a way. Mm. But, um, I don't know, you just have to get over yourself and get used to it. That's usually my answer to everything. Get over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> is this all right? Do you want to have a break or something? Or what? what's happening? We're having a yeah. stop? Have a little break? Mm -hmm. Okay. Break.